Welcome to the Journal. On this weekend before Christmas, I'm struck by a paradox. The news, of course, is not so joyous. Housing prices and home sales are down. More foreclosures are predicted. Oil is near $100 a barrel. The dollar is sinking. Food prices are rising. Recession looming. Starbucks double shot espresso. And yet, on television and just about everywhere we look, people squeezed to the breaking point are constantly being urged to buy, buy, buy. Why not let your kids decide? And if necessary, to go into hock to do it. Now. It's easy. Even if you've been turned down before, you could be approved in minutes of driving the Commercials car. even go out of their way to make adults into children and children into consumers. Make sure you get the right highlighter. There is some resistance to this constant commercializing. Watching early morning cartoons with my grandchildren the other day, I discovered Word Girl, the PBS series of a fifth grade superhero fighting evil with her amazing vocabulary. Listen for the words vague and specific. In this episode, the villain, Mr. Big, has flooded the market with a brand new product called The Thing, which everyone has to have. The Thing! The Thing can do all sorts of stuff. Get one today at a special low, low price. What is it? No one knows or seems to care. But as commercials for the thing hit the airwaves, citizens everywhere are seduced into believing they can't live without it. So they descend in droves to buy as many as they can get. Enter Word Girl. Everyone, stop! You're being tricked. The thing doesn't do anything. Yes, it does. It does so much stuff. The commercial said I need one for my boat. You don't have a boat. Hun, we need a boat for our thing. You don't need a thing. But the commercial said... Watching all this, it seemed a good time to put in a call to Benjamin Barber. Like Word Girl, he's standing athwart history and shouting, Stop! You may remember Benjamin Barber from his international bestseller, Jihad vs. McWorld. Among other things, he's a renowned political theorist and a distinguished senior fellow at Demos, a public policy think tank here in New York City. His latest book is consumed about how the global economy produces too many goods we don't need, too few of those we do need, and to keep the racket going, targets children as consumers in a market where shopping is a 24-hour business. Capitalism, he says, seems quite literally to be consuming itself, leaving democracy in peril and the fate of citizens uncertain. Benjamin Barber answered my call, and he's with me now. Welcome to the Journal. Thank you, Bill. Great to be with you again. Here we are at the height of the holiday season. The malls and the shops are packed. Stuff is flying off the shelves. And like Grinch or Scrooge, you stand up and say, capitalism's in trouble. Why? Because things are flying off the shelves that we don't want or need or even understand what they are, but we go on buying them because capitalism needs us to buy things way beyond the scope of our needs and wants to stay in business, Bill. That's the bottom line. Capitalism is no longer manufacturing goods to meet real needs and human wants. It's manufacturing needs to sell us all the goods it's got to produce. But on the Friday after Thanksgiving, you know, go to the mall, Black Friday, the mall in Burlington, Vermont, where I happen to be, was just packed with with people. I mean, they're not in there buying nothing. You're sure. saying that they don't need that stuff? Sure. They sure don't, and they don't need to shop at 4 a.m. I mean, I, I've been looking for signs saying, please open the stores at 4 a.m. so I can go shopping at 4 a.m., and I don't see any. I mean, that's the store's ideas. That's the marketer's ideas. That's the idea to create this hysteria about purchasing, about buying and selling that makes Americans feel that if they're not in the store at 4 a.m. or 2 a.m., and some of them open at midnight Thursday, and now a whole bunch are open on Thanksgiving. But, but Ben, nobody is forcing them to do that. People out there looking for bargains. You like a good bargain, don't you? I love a good bargain when it's something I need and something I want. But here's the thing. Here's the, here's the thing. We live in a world where there are real needs and real wants. And there's no reason why capitalism shouldn't be addressing those real needs and those real wants. I'll give you an example. Give you a fine example. Here in the United States, we do the cola companies, which couldn't sell enough cola, figured out why sell cola when we can sell water from the tap that people can get for free, but we'll sell it in bottles from the tap. Twenty billion a year. Twenty billion dollars a right, year right. in the bottled bottle water. water. In the third world, there are billions of people without potable, without drinkable, without clean water. 
Now, why shouldn't capitalism figure out how to clean the water out there and get people something they need and make a buck off it, because that's what capitalism does. It makes a profit of taking some chances and meeting real human needs instead of convincing Americans and Europeans that they shouldn't drink pure, clean tap water, but instead pay two bucks a bottle for but it. Those people out there don't have the money to buy it, so that why, why would a company go into a place where people don't have money and try to sell them something? In capitalism, you don't expect the profit right away. You make an investment, you create jobs, you create products, you create productivity. That's the way it worked. That's the way we created in the West our prosperity. But we don't have the patience any longer to do it in the third world. We, want to, we don't want to bring them in to the marketplace. We'd rather exploit a finished marketplace. You're right. Here's the paradox. Those with the dough don't have any needs, those with the needs don't have any dough, and so capitalism has to decide how to treat it, and their decision has been to go for the deed, to go for the dough, regardless of the needs. I was called on Black Friday by a lot of radio and TV stations, tell us what's going on, what's wrong with American consumers, which is kind of what you and I have been talking about, but the troubles were looking the wrong way. It's not what's wrong with American consumers. It's what's wrong with American capitalism, American advertisers, American marketers. We're not asking for it. It's what I call push capitalism. It's supply side. They've got to sell all this stuff, and they have to figure out how to get us to want it. So they take adults and they infantilize them. They dumb them yeah. down. They get us to want things. And then they start targeting children because it's not enough just to sell to the adults. You've got to sell to that wonderful demographic. First, it's 12 to 18-year-olds. Then it's the tweens the 10 to the 12-year-olds, but then it's the toddlers. You used a word that went right past me, infantilize. What do you mean? What I mean is that grown-ups, part of being grown-up is getting hold of yourself and saying, I don't need this. I've got to be a gatekeeper for my kid. I want to live in a pluralistic world where, yes, I shop, but I also pray and play and do art and make love and make artwork and do lots of different things, and shopping is one part of that. As an adult, we know that. But if you live in a capitalist society that needs to sell us all the time. They've got to turn that prudent, thoughtful adult back into a child who says, gimme, 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 I want, I want, I want, just like the kid in the candy store, and is grasping and reaching. But isn't all of this part of what keeps the hamster uh, running? I mean, it, it is. But part of the problem here is that the capitalist companies have figured out that the best way to do their job is to privatize profit but socialize risk. That what is to mean? say, ask the taxpayer yeah. to pay for it when things go down. The banks now that have just screwed up so big, not one of those banks is going to go under because they'll be bailed out by the feds because the feds, the federal government will say, we can't afford this gigantic multi-billion dollar bank to go under. Happened with Chrysler 20, 30 years ago. Keep the doing, wheel going. And therefore, it's impossible to fail if you're a business. You never get punished. Now, the whole point of profit is to reward risk. But what we've done today is socialize risk. You and I, and all of your listeners out there, pay when companies like subprime market mortgage companies and the banks go bad. We pay for it. They don't. I heard a commercial from a big bank, a, a multinational bank. I won't mention the name here. But it was actually saying, and this is fairly close to the verbatim that I heard. It said, okay, we're coming into the season where you want a lot of things and you don't have any money. What do you do? You call us whatever you want. We'll make it happen. Yeah. And, and what this, is that? And this is after the crisis. This is yeah, the, yeah, not no, before. This, was, this is after. This was this a few is days now. ago. This is now. So what's at stake? You write so much about democracy. What's at stake for democracy? Well, there are two things at stake here. First of all, capitalism itself is at stake because capitalism cannot stay indefinitely in business trying to manufacture needs for people, the middle class in the developed world, who have most of what they need. It has to figure out how to address the real needs of people. And it's not just in the third world. We have real needs here for alternative energy. And I would want to reward corporations that invest in alternative energy, not just biofuels and so on, but also that look at geothermal, that look at wind, that look at tidal. Tidal is an amazing new field where you use the tides and the motion of the tides. It's expensive, difficult right now, but that's what you get your profits for by investing in that. So there are lots of things we can do. Coastlines around this country with global warming are rising. We know hurricane damage, housing that can withstand water. Big thing. You could make a lot of money figuring out how to build inexpensive housing that withstands hurricanes, withstands flooding. Very few people are doing it. That's the way capitalism ought to be right. working. So number one, then, capitalism itself is in trouble. But second of all, capitalism has put democracy in trouble because capitalism has tried to persuade us that being a private consumer is enough. 
that a citizen is nothing more than a consumer, that voting means spending your dollars, spreading around your private prejudices, your private preferences, not reaching public judgments, not finding common ground, not making decisions about the social consequences of private judgments, but just making the private judgments and letting it fall where it will. You know, something else that I wonder about, you know, I was in Vermont. In this little town, I was reminded, it has a, there's a town square, there's a police station, there's a fire station, there's a city hall, there's a school just to block off the town square, uh, there are the shops along the way. It reminded me of Marshall, Texas, where I grew up. Something's happened with these shopping malls. You no longer have a sense of, of the participation of everybody in anything except shopping. Any one of those towns is an exemplar of the variety and diversity of American life. Now compare that town to a mall. You walk through the mall, nothing there but shops. You can walk for miles and think that the whole world is constituted by retail shopping and nothing else. You go to the mall, there's nothing else there. But there are jobs there. People are working there. No and people say, this, you know, barber, moyers, get with it. This is the 21st century, not the first half of the 20th century. I mean, the world has changed. Yeah, but there's jobs in the drug industry. There's jobs in the penitentiaries. You know, you can say, gee, the prison expansion is good. More jobs for guards. I mean, sure, anything provides jobs. The question is, at what price? Where do we want the jobs to be? Do we want our jobs to be in education? Do we want our jobs to be in the arts? Do we want our jobs to be in general services? Do we want our jobs to be in health? Or do we want our jobs to be in selling gadgets, selling unnecessary food that makes half the country obese? I think it's 55 percent. Where do we want the jobs? And again, that's a social decision. The market puts the jobs wherever the marketers push them to. What we need to do as citizens is say, where do we want the jobs to be? What kinds of jobs do we want our young people to so have? So you're, you're saying that there's a, there's a role for, uh, for, for intervention? I mean, say this very quietly, I'm, very quiet, because neither Milton, the Democrats Milton, nor the Wherever he is, yeah, Milton yeah, Friedman yeah, is whirling. Yeah. Well, wherever Milton Friedman is right now, he's at the soul of the Republican and the Democratic yeah. parties. And the reality is here, there is a powerful role for, I'm not going to say our government, for democratic institutions, for citizens, for participatory institutions. They include our government, they include our townships, they include our PTAs, they include our NGOs and our philanthropies. There's a whole civil society, which is a whole lot more than just the government, where we act not as private consumers or selfish individuals, but we act as neighbors, we act as citizens, we act as friends to establish the social character of the world we live in. And we keep doing it wrong. You know, we support, we support, well, everyone loves Walmart as a consumer. So do I. Lots of goods, cheap prices. But it has social consequences that as consumers we don't think about. We know it means low wages, it means low wages without pensions, it, mean, it means uh, wage earners who don't have proper health care. But worse than that, it means the destruction of mom and pop stores, the destruction of retail, the destruction of those very little shops you were talking about that are at the heart of America's villages and towns. And we've but that's got the to creative the destructionism that's at the heart of, the, of capitalism. But you know what? Democracy has a simple rule. The social conscious, the citizen trumps the consumer. We, Milton Friedman, with his help, we've inverted that. Now the consumer trumps the citizen. And we're getting a society that manifests the trumping by the consumer of civics, which means a selfish, privatized, and ultimately corrupt society, and one no one wants their own children to grow up in. Here's a question. Maybe it comes from your book. When politics permeates everything, we call it totalitarianism. When religion permeates everything, we call it theocracy. <laughs> but when commerce pervades everything, we call it liberty. Well, that is the central paradox of our times. And as Americans, I would think we understand that above all, democracy means pluralism. If everything's religion, we rightly distrust it. If everything's politics, even a good politics, we rightly distrust it. But when everything's marketing, when everything's retail, when everything's shopping, we somehow think that enhances our freedom. Well, it doesn't. It has the same corrupting effect on the fundamental diversity and variety of that our lives that make us human, that make us happy. And in that sense, focusing on shopping and the fulfillment of private consumer desires actually undermines our happiness. Help me understand that, because so many people will say choice is joy. And they are right. But the question is, what kind of choice? You go to L.A. today, you can rent or buy 200 different kinds of automobile. Mm -hmm. And then 
in those automobiles, you can sit no matter which one you're in for five hours not moving on the freeway system there. The one choice you don't have is genuine, efficient, cheap, accessible public transportation. There's nothing as a consumer you can do to get it because the choice for yeah. public transportation is a social choice, a civic choice. I can't go it's out and buy a subway system. Exactly, right? you can't do that. And no choice that's available to you allows you to do that. So many of our choices today are trivial. We feel that we're expanding and enhancing our choice, but the big choices, a green environment, a safe city for our kids, good education, simply are not available through private consumer choices. That's the problem with vouchers for schools. You know, we think that with vouchers we can all find a good school, but if education itself is going under and is not supported as a social good, no amount of private choice is going to give any of our kids in public or private schools appropriate education. I read the other day that we are spending more than we are saving. We have become a true significant debtor nation. What does that mean in the long run? Well, it means a couple of things, and it is, by the way, a devastating economic fact. And here the economists will agree with me, a political scientist and a political theorist, that it's no good for a country to do that. A country that stops saving becomes a debtor nation in every way. That's why we're in, ho in hock to China and the others who own dollars. That's why the dollar has collapsed abroad. But it also means that we are no longer in a position to create the forms of industry, capitalism, and social consciousness that comes from saving. Saving is how we invest in the future. Saving means that we are putting money aside, deferring our own gratification to create a future that our children can be part of. When we spend it all on ourselves now, and then more than we have, we put ourselves, and more importantly, we put the future itself in hawk. We're really selling our kids and grandkids when we do that. Yeah, we're at the mercy then, aren't we, of China and Dubai? I mean, just as we're sitting here talking, I have resonating in my head the report on the radio the other morning that Citicorp is receiving a $7.5 billion infusion from Abu Dhabi. What's going on? People have to go into their ancient history memory banks to remember that just a couple of years ago, Dubai ports, it yeah. was a big, yeah. we can't let Dubai ports take over our ports in the United States. We have our sovereignty and so on. And people screamed and, you know, uproar about it. And we, Dubai ports was eliminated from the mix. But meanwhile, Dubai is buying the United States wholesale, along with China and other countries. We make a fuss about our sovereignty in politics when we have debates, but we sell our sovereignty down the river by becoming a debtor nation, becoming a nation which in effect lives beyond its means, has to borrow from abroad, has to sell its dollars cheap abroad in order to go on being a debtor nation, go on being a consumer nation. These again are social and public consequences of private choice, which we just don't. When you and I go to the mall on Black Friday, we just think, man, there's a bargain. But that's globalization, we isn't do it? We do all that. It is globalization, but we're on the wrong end of globalization. What do you mean? China that owns our dollars is on the right end of globalization. Right, right. The U.S. is selling itself. China is buying. China is buying into the global market. America is selling itself out in that global market. So you, you're right. You've got to deal with an interdependent world. You've got to deal with globalization. But the way we're doing it, selfishly, using only a consumer mentality, is to assure that America is on the losing end. But paradoxically, you know, money is washing through the world. Lots of big winners right now. Who's losing in all of well, not only are there billions, literally billions, you know, people in the developing world, in Africa, in Southern Asia, in Latin America, who continue to be not just losers, but losers bigger than before, because the gap in rich and poor is growing, not declining. Up until about 1970, from World War right. II to the 70s, it diminished. Starting in the 70s, it plateaued out, and now it's been increasing and increasing. That's true of both North-South, and it's true even within the United States. And of course, the point about the losers is they are invisible. In, there was that great book called The Invisible Man, back in the days when to be black was to be invisible. Now it's the invisible poverty of the world. And the great majority of the world's people live in poverty. They have real needs and wants. Capitalism won't address them because it doesn't figure it can make enough profit off addressing them. And so instead it addresses all these faux needs. That inequality, of course, is the deep driver behind global instability, global war, and even global terrorism. I don't mean by that that terrorists are poor. I mean to say the instability, the weak state systems, the economic poverty that disables societies create a climate within which terrorism and fundamentalism can grow. So we are ignoring an inequality 
that is going to come and haunt us. In fact, we are living today in a new world of walls. You know, what we think is that every time you see some inequality, build a wall. Gated community here in the U.S., a wall between us and Mexico, a wall between Israel and the Palestinians. Isn't it an ironic, Bill, that, what is it, 17 years after the fall of the wall, which was the emblem of totalitarianism in Berlin and between East and West in Europe, we have now turned to the wall as our primary defense against even seeing the inequalities, let alone dealing with the inequalities that our capitalism is creating. But don't leave us down in the dumps. I mean, how <laughs> do we encourage capitalism to do what it does best, which is to meet real human needs? Well, let me say, I think there's three things we can do. First of all, we as consumers have to be tougher. We are the gatekeepers for our kids and our families. We have to be tougher. I mean, I ask anyone out there who needs to go out at 2 a.m. to go shopping. For God's sakes, wait till Monday afternoon. Second thing is capitalism has to begin to earn the profits to which it has a right when it takes real risks. And there are companies doing it. I'll give you a couple of hopeful examples. There's a company in Denmark that's gotten very rich very fast making something called the Life Straw. To think about this long. And in it are nine filters that filter out all the contaminants and germs that you find in third world cesspool water. If you buy one of these for a couple bucks, that's all it takes. A woman in the third world and her family can drink through that straw, and it doesn't matter what water they have available. It cleanses that water. The little firm in Denmark that makes that life straw is making out like a capitalist bandit, we'd say. But properly so. They're being rewarded for taking a risk, inventing something that is needed. Folks working in alternative energy, some of them are going to make real money, and that's a good thing. That's what they ought to be doing. So capitalism has to start, and there are many cases. Creative capitalism, doing, tough consumers. And third. number three, we've got to retrieve our citizenship. We can't buy the line that government is our enemy and the market is our friend. We used to say government can do everything, the market can do nothing. That was a mistake. But now we seem to say the market can do everything and government can do any, nothing. Government is us. Government is our institutions. Government is how we make social and public choices working together. We've got to retrieve our citizenship. The book is Consumed. My subtitle is Staying in Bed or Coping with Cognitive Dissonance. <laughs> Benjamin Barber, thanks for being with me. Thanks so much, Bill.